What's up guys, Richard here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to the third devlog in the magic language learning game. So I'm going to start with what we've done so far. So as you can see on my screen already, we've replaced those random boxes with some stock animations and also uh, this, um, I guess it's like a skinned mesh. Now this is not our animations or mesh, we're just using these temporarily because I wanted to build out the animation system and integrate that with all the other systems that I've developed. So over the last week I've been implementing this, uh, basically making sure it all works. So if I hit tab here because the enemy's over to the left, he'll look that way. If I'm behind the wall, he won't see the enemy, so he'll stop looking. Then if he sees the enemy, great. Now there's the enemy. If I want to attack the enemy, I can either run at them and they'll run at me and the whole fight will start, or I can just fire off my fireball, the battle starts, the camera zooms out, and then I can just start casting away my lovely fireball, and I'm just going to kill him so you can see the end sequence, he dies, casting ends, and then I can just run around again. That's pretty much what we've implemented surface-wise. Now underneath, there's been a lot that's happened, because in the previous videos, the prototype was pretty much hard-coded, and the code that the enemy used and the player used were separate, although a lot of it could have been reused. So what I did is I grabbed all the systems that I had before, tore it completely apart, basically rewrote the entire thing, and made it all into very modular pieces. I also developed a uh, behavior tree, because Flax doesn't have a built-in behavior tree system like Unreal Engine, so I developed my own one. Now what I'm going to do is first I'm going to show you some of the artwork that the artist has done, give you something a little bit more interesting, and then I'll jump into the code. And if you're not interested in the code, you can pretty much just drop out from there because that will be the end of like development-wise on the surface what we've done. So let's have a look at the artwork. Now, the artist has worked on two things. So Saban, my artist, he's worked on the enemy concepts and he's also worked on environmental. So these are the concepts here. Ignore this random Homer Simpson slash uh, family guy character down there. Uh, when he gets distracted, he draws random stuff. Anyway, so these are the, the concepts. All those ones before that, I guess. Was there anything after that? Oh, that's like the target dummy. So we're looking at like these dark looking ones with the glowing eyes and their hands all wrapped up. These are kind of going to be like bosses. Uh, that text written on the front of that enemy there, that's just a filler. We're not actually going to use that in the game because that's actually coming from another game. Uh, so we're looking at the dark ones possibly being the enemies, and then these other ones are possibly going to be like the standard enemy that are enemies that are running around the map. So you've got your little rat and your skeleton. Um, not sure about the... I'm going to call him the fish guy, and I know my artist hates that, but yeah, he's the fish guy. And then we've got this random chest that opens up and shoots... I don't know, laser out of its eyes, but we'll figure that out. He's also worked on the environmental. So originally, if you probably noticed here, it's no longer like just isometric. It's an isometric view, but like the camera's in the same position, but now it's perspective. The reason being is because um, Saban thought that it would look actually more dynamic and more real. Well, not more real, but look just better in a perspective, but from an isometric view. So we changed that around. Anyway, um, he did this artwork before we changed that around, but it's not really going to impact on it. This big grey one down here, we kind of played around with this idea of the whole map being tile-based, but there's just so many issues involved in that, that we decided to go with like tile-based walls and buildings and random items, but then the map would use the Flax inbuilt terrain system. Okay, so that is what we've pretty much done actually like, um, I guess, progress-wise. There, there hasn't been that much surface progress, but underneath, when we jump into the code and we have a look at that, there has been a lot of progress. So now comes the code and system side of things, and if you're not interested in that, you can drop out from this video. So this is what we've got. Animation graph. I'm going to open this up. So for the animation graph, we've got basically three variables. The head rotation handles where he's looking. Acceleration is a zero to one scalar. Um, and then is casting just obviously is he casting so what we do is we perform like all the movement and casting stuff and then we add on top of that this whole aim IK which is like aiming the head and pretty much it's a very simple state machine at this stage the run state pretty much just consists of a blend between a idle and a running which is nice and simple and then you've got your casting which is pretty much just a casting animation. Um, the, the complexity comes inside like 
going into the casting and going out of the casting at the moment. Going out of the casting is probably the most complex thing. So that's the animation graph. Feel free to like pause and steal stuff along the way. Okay, now let's go have a look at the code itself. So everything has been put into kind of like a modular setup and I'll start with the character. Now, all characters in this game will inherit from this character base class. Nothing special there. So we've got then our enemy AI inherits from that and then our player um, also inherits from that because they share a lot of functionality. Obviously, they're both characters that run around. Now, the enemy AI is actually going to then have multiple diverge classes that will represent all the different types of enemy AI. But at the moment, since I've only got one, I've only got the one enemy AI. Now, the most interesting thing in the enemy AI is probably my implementation of a behavior tree. So, the behavior tree, I've got two. I've got an in-combat behavior tree and then a not-in-combat behavior tree because behavior trees get really complex really fast in code, so I just decided to split those out. And since it's such an easy thing to do, and I don't want it jumping through so many nodes when you're not even like having like things to concern about. Like when you're in combat, you don't care about moving around or following paths. That's just not relevant. So I just split it out. It just made sense. And then I made these like wrapper classes for like variables so that I can pass them in and out of different behaviors within the behavior tree. Uh, and then let's jump down to the behavior tree itself. So I construct a behavior tree and I'll basic I'll explain how this works. So a behavior tree is essentially just nodes that are either selectors or sequences. And if it's a selector, let's say there's two different things. Um, well, in fact, I don't even have to say that. I can literally just show you. So if I come down to here, this selector node, it basically has two options. It can either do the hasn't seen the player or seen the player. So it's going to run one of those. And it just dives into it and then checks each one of these nodes. And then each one of these nodes is like linked into other nodes. So to show you how this works in a very simple form, because as you can see, the not in combat behavior tree is massive. By the way, if you guys want a tutorial on how to write behavior trees in C Sharp for Flax, I can do that. Um, um, it's not a massive priority at the moment because I am developing this entire game. But let's just have a quick look at the behavior tree for the not in combat. Oh, sorry, for in combat because this one's really simple at this stage. So all it does is it goes to the in combat behavior tree's base node, which is a selector. And the selector has only one choice target the player sequence. And the sequence basically just does the first node, then the second, then the third, and it goes through all the nodes until it hits a failure, then it returns, and it doesn't perform any of the nodes after that. So it goes in, and the first node it does is rotate the body towards the player, and then rotate the head towards the player. These two are never going to fail. It's always just going to rotate. So that's, gonna, that's going to occur no matter what. Then obviously in the future I'll implement things like what the different spells this enemy can cast, and also counter spells to the player, etc, etc. Um, you can see a lot of this type of decision making happening in this behavior tree here for the not in combat. So I'll just scroll through this a little bit slowly. You guys can pause and try and like read through this and understand it. These are all the nodes up here that get called by the behavior tree. And this is all the sequences and selectors of the behavior tree. And that's pretty much all I'm going to do. I'm not going to dive into this because I could speak for like three hours about how this behavior tree works. So that's pretty much it. Now, if you have a look at the player and the enemy, if I select the player and I'm going to pull this across right about now, you'll see they have a bunch of scripts on them. They've got a player movement, a player management script, which is, manages the input. Then a player movement script, which is kind of called by the player management script. Management script handles, should I be moving, shouldn't I be moving, and things related to that. While the player movement script is like, I'm just going to move, based on input. And then the head and body control basically handles uh, the rotation of the body and the head, because those are all animation dependent. And then I've got a casting system script, which is basically access uh, the input of the player during casting and break that down into something that can be used by the system and then the camera follow script which is basically 
uh, just the camera following the en uh, the player around. Now the enemy has kind of a similar thing. So if I get out of this and I go to the enemy, they've got a few of these. So they've got the head and body control. Then they've got their own AI movement script, which is navigation based as opposed to input based. And then the enemy AI script, which handles the overarching things like should I be able to move or not? Am I alive? Am I dead? Etc. Okay, so let's go back into the code now. We've looked at the character. Let's have a look at the character utilities. This is where the majority of the work's been done. As you can see, it's broken down into behavior tree stuff, magic system, which is the casting stuff, movement system, and then just a few generic ones. So I'll start with the generic ones. We've got the camera follow script. This is only used by the player. As you can see, there's basically two states. It's either following a player and the player's chosen target, or it's following the player. That's pretty much it. Then I've got a focus management script. Now the focus management script, all this does is allow the player to select multiple different targets. So like tab between each target and based on how far away those targets are and whether those targets are in combat, it just tracks the possible targets of the player. Uh, camera, I already said that one. And then the head and body. This here, as you can see, it's actually quite complex. It handles the whole rotation of the body plus the head movement where it also checks that the head can actually see its target. If the head can't see its target, then it doesn't look at its target. It handles all this stuff underneath. Also it deals with stuff like, is there a particle between the enemy and the target? And if there is, then ignore that because it's all ray casting based, etc., etc. Then obviously does all these conversions and then also does things uh, regarding like managing all the animations as well for the player. So should it be casting, doing a casting animation? Should it be doing a running animation? So it's actually a really complex script. So I wanted to be able to just like um, extract this from all the other code so I didn't get it all confused. Okay, the behavior tree. Now this is where things get complex. This behavior tree, um, it's actually not one class, it's a multitude of node classes. So you have your, uh, well, let me go, where, where is it? Let me just find the top. I should really split this out into separate ones. Okay, so these are the wrappers. These allow you to pass variables in and out of the behavior tree. Then you have your base node class, and then under that you've got your sequence and your selector, and then you've got just all your different possible nodes that can be passed into the behavior tree. And there's, I don't know, I think there's like 20 plus nodes at the moment. I could like scroll through here for a while. And all these nodes manage different aspects of the, the enemy AI's behavior. And the reason I wanted to go with a behavior tree rather than just using switches and stuff is because I'm going to have so many different enemies and each enemy is going to react in a different way. Like rat enemy might react different to skeleton enemy. So I wanted to be able to easily just construct behaviors for each enemy. And if I use like switch and if statements, it gets really cumbersome really quick and it gets hard to track things. I, I found that pretty much straight away when building the prototype. This is just so much cleaner and I can rapidly make changes and I can also follow reading back backwards through the behavior tree to find where problems are. I've got this random location. All this one basically does is just generates random locations around the enemy for him to go check those spots if at the end of a navigation loop when looking for the player. Okay, so let's have a look at the magic system. Magic system is basically you've got these, this casting animation script and spell object script. Casting animation handles the animations that will be played because there might be multiple different casting animations. And spell object script basically handles the spells because spells can have different animations, they can have different particles, they can move at different speeds, they can cause different amounts of damage, etc, etc. Uh, now, we've got the magic input system. This basically just converts the user's input into something that's actually usable by the player's uh, magic system overall. So when I type in fireball, it converts all what I've typed into into something that the system will understand. Now you probably notice that there's a ton of these input keys that I've made here and you're, you're thinking, why didn't I just read the string? Well, the reason is because one, I didn't want to have all these other possible inputs like, you know, maybe the player accidentally hits forward slash. Two, I also wanted to be able to manipulate the player's input. So if the player types in certain things like C and X, I wanted to be able to easily just manipulate that. I may change the system, I don't know yet. Um, I will I will find out that further once I start implementing Esperanto as a language and then also other languages. Okay, and then finally we've got the casting system and the casting system just basically um, grabs all these other ones and just pulls it together. So first the magic system says, okay, cast fireball. 
it sends that to the casting system. The casting system goes, okay, I'm going to check, do I have an animation for the fireball? Yes, I do. Okay, I'm going to play that animation. And then it goes, okay, I'm going to generate a spell object, uh, which is this spell object here, and I'm going to instantiate that in the world and then shoot that off. And at the same time, I'm going to track what spells I've shot off because I have like a, a spell stack. So I can type something, enter, type something, enter, and have multiple spells fire off one after the other. Okay, then we have the movement system, and I think this will probably be the last system. I'm not going to bother with the particle system or the cameras. The, actually, I'll quickly just cover the, cam the face camera. This is a very handy thing. Uh, so we've got the text renderer, which basically renders out what the player's typed in. This will basically just f face the text renderer towards the camera. So if you just want a quick script for facing something towards the camera, here you go. Feel free to copy that. Uh, yep. Anyway, now let's go down to the movement system. Okay, so we have our base movement system, which handles a few things like acceleration and gravity and some stuff like that. Stuff that's going to be used by both the AI and the player. Then, of course, we've got our own player and AI um, derived classes of that. Now, the player one, basically what it does is it just handles input. And this script, right, well, this section of code right here, this code block, this handles the isometric style camera movement where you press up, you move forward based on the camera's perspective and then left, you move left based on the camera's perspective. So if you want to build out an isometric game, you pretty much only need this realistically right here. Everything else is just baggage for my game. Uh, then the AI movement system works basically the same, it's called in the same way, but instead of having like input obviously from the keyboard, it accesses the navigation system and it generates paths based on um, where the, the player is or where it should be running to. Is it running towards its home location? Well, generate a path towards that. And this is basically a wrapper for the sub-navigation system, which is then a wrapper for the flax navigation system. Uh, there's reasons for why I've got multiple classes in place, but basically this allows me to just go, hey, navigation system, how close am I to this point? Oh, you're very close? Okay, increment the point. Hey, navigation system, have I finished? Have I reached the end of my path? Oh, great. Am I at the very end of that path? Oh, even better. Well, build me a new path based on whatever I'm targeted at this very time and based on whether I want to be moving at this very time. And then it just also generates some things like uh, some heading variables, acceleration, velocity, um, because my whole system's velocity based as opposed to just, uh, uh, what would you call it? Um, oh, I forget. it. It's a velocity based system anyway. And then we've got my wrapper system, which is the navigation subsystem. And this just basically accesses the Flax navigation system, but makes it very friendly for um, the AI movement system, which makes it friendly for the behavior system. And when I say friendly, it means it basically hides a whole heap of functionality that of the navigation system, which is just too low level uh, that I don't need to deal with. And... I can basically wrap up in certain classes that do it all the time. And as you can see here, it just basically does things like um, get if the path is complete, set the current path position, get the path position, because basically the Flax navigation system, all it does is generate an array of vectors, which is the points along, and that's all it does. It doesn't allow you to follow things along. So this is what my wrapper class does. Um, if you guys want, like, I I'll literally just slowly scroll through this. Feel free to just rip my code and use it yourself. There you go, you have a navigation system. Probably the only one you don't need is this gravity. In fact, I don't even know if I even need this in here. This is probably just a useless class, uh, useless function left over from the past. But that's pretty much it for my movement system. So I've covered the uh, magic system, movement system, particles, nothing special, and I've covered the camera system. So done and dusted. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you want me to go into a bit more detail about any specific system I put in place, just let me know. I may make a tutorial or I may cover it in a future video. Um, basically, I am implementing so many systems so fast at the moment that I can't just step through and show you guys exactly how every single thing is built. For example, that behavior system took me like an entire day to build, and then if I have to build it and explain it to you at the same time, that video is going to be hours and hours long. But if you guys want like a very simple behavior tree, um, I could build that and just show you guys how to do it. Anyway, that's pretty much it for the end of this video. If you like it, like it, share it around, sub to the channel. See you all in the next video.